And now we have a, a, a real treat um, with respect to our professionalism hour uh, this afternoon, something a little bit different for bankruptcy lawyers to get to hear from one of our Supreme Court justices with respect to the Chief Justice's Commission on Professionalism and Nancy Whaley, who is our Chapter 12 and 13 trustee in the Northern District of Georgia, is going to moderate that panel. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nancy. Thank you, Byron. Can everyone hear us all right? So it's great to be here. And this is a joint program with the W. Homer Drake Jr. Uh, Georgia Bankruptcy American Inn of Court. And so all of our inn members that were here, we're glad that you're here and welcome to the State Bar Bankruptcy Section Annual CLE Program. Um, and if you have an interest in the court um, or in the inn, I'm sure if you see any inn member and express that interest, um, we're always looking for new and enthusiastic people um, to become members of the inn, especially young lawyers. It's a great opportunity to mix and mingle with lawyers from all over the state and judges. So um, it's, I was just talking with Grant Stein. Grant, you're around here somewhere, I'm sure. Yep. And uh, it's kind of exciting that this will be the, in June, will be the inn's fourth um, annual dinner, so it's kind of hard to believe that we've been around that long, and um, it's gone by very quickly, and the inn is doing some great work, and it's fun to do this joint program with the State Bar Bankruptcy Section. It's kind of fun for me to be here today because um, Shana Steinfeld here in the room. Shana and I, when we were on the board for the State Bar Bankruptcy Section, we had this brainstorm idea that we would do a destination. We always, this program always used to be in Atlanta, and so we came up with the idea to do a destination. Our first one, I believe, was at Brasstown Valley. And so it's really exciting for us to always come back year after year and see it grow and people from all over the state. And I think that's probably a unique program for a state as large as Georgia, where we all get together once a year and um, commingle with our um, fellow coll um, coll or collegiate friends um, throughout the whole state. So um, it's great to be here. It's really exciting for me to be here. Um, I'm on the uh, State Bar Board of Governors, and I used to be on the Executive Committee, so I've always had the great opportunity to mix and mingle with our um, Georgia Supreme Court justices. We, the Bar does an annual reach, um, meeting with the Supreme Court justices, and it's a great time. But um, when I was asked to reach out to one of our justices to see about this program, I thought it's really exciting because it is an opportunity that most people that practice in the federal courts, that do, when you don't have a large state court practice, to really intermix with and intermingle with our justices in here what's going on in the, throughout the state and what's going on with our uh, Supreme Court. So I'm really happy to have with me today Justice Britt Grant. She's a native Atlanta, and she was appointed by Governor Nathan Deal to the Supreme Court January 1, 2017. So you're coming up on a one-year anniversary um, with the expansion of the court. And so we're going to kind of do this just as a conversation. Um, we're going to allow time at the end, so please start thinking about it. If you have a question, there are pads of paper, um, I think, on most tables. If you would like to feel more comfortable writing a question down, um, just hold it up at any point, and somebody will come through and gather those questions, or just feel free to raise your hand um, when we go into the Q&A session and ask your questions. So we're going to start off with just hearing um, Justice Grant tell us a little bit about herself. And so we'll start off. So welcome to uh, our world of bankruptcy, and thank you for being here. And well, this is the best context to be involved in bankruptcy. It's certainly better than being involved as a personal matter. So I'm really happy to be here. And I've joked that my CLE calendar has gotten very full this year with different uh, different talks around the state. But this is a really special one, and I'm I'm very glad to be here. I'll also note that I've not looked at the statistics, but I suspect that December may be the most popular month for professionalism credit. So <laughs> good job, good job getting your professionalism credit in before the grace period. That's I will say we'll talk a little bit more about the Chief Justice's Commission on Professionalism later, but I think one thing that we're all concerned with is trying to make sure that professionalism actually becomes easier to get and becomes something that folks might get, you know, more than one professionalism credit a year, because it really is an expansive topic that we'll We'll share a little bit more about later. Um, as Nancy said, I am an, a native of Atlanta. I grew up here. I ended up marrying my high school sweetheart, so now our entire extended family is here, which means we're some of the few people that aren't traveling outside of Atlanta for the holidays coming up. Um, we moved to DC in, um, after college and intended to live there for a few years, and a few years began to extend further and further out until we decided, well, either we're moving back to Atlanta, which has always been our plan, or we're going to be those people who 
accidentally become DC natives and somehow turn around 40 years later and live in DC still. So we're very happy to get back home to Atlanta and to Georgia and have um, put down our roots here. We've got three children ages four, six, and eight. So um, we, we keep pretty busy, but it's, it's great to be here back in Georgia these last you know, five years or so. So, Justice, you, you went to Wake Forest University, and did you take time off between college and law school? I did. Um, as I said, we, um, we my, married my husband right after college. He had gone to University of Georgia, and I went to Wake Forest. And so we, um, we got married after college and moved to D.C., and I worked on the Hill um, in the office of then-Congressman Nathan Deal. Um, that turned out to be a, a great connection to have. Um, and um, after that, so I was on the Hill for about a year, and then I worked, I got the fantastic opportunity to work at the White House for the next three. So we ended up staying in D.C. that, as, in that initial time for four years. Um, and then after that, I went to law school out in California. And so tell us a little bit about being in the White House and what, what role did you have in the White House? It, it, was, it was an incredible experience, I think, at any age, but especially for a young person to have the, some of your formative years be spent in that environment um, is just an exceptional opportunity. And I served in a number of different roles. They were all involved in the domestic policy arena. Um, I started out at the, at the Domestic Policy Council, and that's the, that's the body that's in charge of the president's domestic agenda. Um, but I started out actually just a few weeks before September 11, 2001. And so obviously everything turned on a dime for everyone that day, but particularly at the White House. Um, the, the policy initiatives that the president had certainly, many of those still continued, but a lot of what we, what we did at that time we called domestic consequences. So it was very different than any of us had imagined, but really an even more meaningful time to to be there in that environment. Yeah, I think we all have um, our own days and memories of 9-11 mm -hmm. and that we, we carry with us. And for many of us, it, it shaped us in many ways in the right. years to come. So you go to Stanford and um, enjoy the beautiful weather of California. Yes, that's and, fantastic. Um, so from law school, you moved back to Georgia? No, not, qu not quite yet, <laughs> despite our, our best statements to family members that we were surely coming back to Atlanta after this sojourn in California. DC called again, um, and I ended up clerking on the, the Court of, United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit for a year, and then practiced at Kirkland and Ellis after that. In, um, in private practice, did you have any kind of specialty? And I was on the litigation side, but one reason I chose Kirkland Ellis was that they don't, unlike many firms now, they don't actually force or even encourage you to specialize in a particular area of litigation. So I did, I did trial work and appellate work. I did antitrust, some bankruptcy on the appellate level, um, some bankruptcy related to insurance issues, multi-district litigation, um, the, a wide variety. We even did some Section 1983 plaintiff's work, which is not your typical D.C. big firm um, cause of action, but it was, a, it was a pretty wide area of practice. Yeah. So making the kind of the shift from uh, government work in the White House and in D.C. and, and private practice more on the more of a federal practice side. Mm -hmm. um, so now you've been appointed by Governor Deal. So Kind of what was, how do you see your journey to the Supreme Court? Sure, well, as I said, I had a, I had a broad background and I think I really thrive on being a generalist. Um, I think it, it keeps me a little bit fresher to have a different thing every day, which is really perfect for an appellate court that has a wide jurisdiction. But when, I, when we were moving back to Atlanta, I found out about, out about an opportunity in the Georgia Attorney General's office and had really valued my opportunity to be in public service in Washington, D.C., and was excited through happenstance to find out about a chance to do, um, to do public service in Georgia. And so I think being the Attorney General's office and eventually as Solicitor General was really a, you couldn't have a more perfect stepping stone. Um, the Georgia Solicitor General, I was only the second one, and so they've now had a Solicitor General for about five years. It's modeled um, largely on the federal Solicitor General, who of course handles cases for the United States before the U.S. Supreme Court. On the state level, um, we handle cases, we, we manage the state's appellate litigation in the Georgia Court of Appeals, Georgia Supreme Court, and then of course the federal courts of appeals and the U.S. Supreme Court. It's a busy so, office. Busy, very busy office. Um, it's fortunately the, the last Attorney General and the current one, Chris Carr, get great credit for first starting this office and now Chris has started to staff it up more, and it, it really recognizes that um, the Solicitor General can't handle every case and shouldn't handle every case, but I do think there's a value towards some of the specialty in appellate practice. There are different, 
different aspects. Those of you who are involved in, in both pieces of it know that as well. There are different things you need to focus on in appellate advocacy versus trial work. So yeah. I think that's been a, a great move for the Attorney General's office. So did you, um, being, becoming a judge, mm -hmm. uh, was that something in your uh, career goals or was it something more that just uh, you were at the right place at the right time? And You know, a little bit of both. My sister actually growing up was the one who thought that being a federal judge would be the perfect job because you had job security. And <laughs> once, you, once you got that job, you couldn't lose it. So that was what was most appealing to her. Um, at, at that time, it wasn't something I thought about very much until once I got down here, of course, working on issues of appeals for the state, I was thinking a lot about Georgia law and a lot about federal law and had some friends who were judges in the Court of Appeals and Supreme Court, and they encouraged me to start thinking about it. And so I, I appreciate that encouragement. And, Unfortunately, everything moved in that direction. Well, we're glad that you're there. So um, a lot of us that may not really know a lot about the how the Supreme Court is comprised, and um, as most of you do know, the, the judges are either appointed but eventually will run for office, and it's my understanding you will be running for office right, next in year May. in May, so everybody keep that in mind. Um, but so tell us a little bit about just how many justices do we have on our court, and sure. how, what are the terms? We've, we've got nine justices on the court, and until January 1, when I was appointed, there were seven. Um, so Governor Deal has done a lot, of, a lot of judicial initiatives, and including he added three judges to the Court of Appeals, and then two justices to the Supreme Court. Um, so there are nine of us on the court. Everyone has been extremely welcoming and generous. There's a, a famous case from the Michigan Supreme Court, I believe it is, that begins, a dissent begins. I disagree with my former friend and current colleague, Justice such and such. And so we're very thankful that we don't have that kind of atmosphere on the court. It's been a really welcoming court. And we, you know, we disagree on cases, but we work through them in a very civil and collegial way. And I think that helps us get to the right answer more often and more easily. And so um, what is your term as a justice? The term, um, initially, initially when you're, most people are appointed, that's, that's not always the case, but most people are appointed as, a, as an initial matter. And then according to the law, your term, you have to run for election, depending on the calendar, between six months and a year and a half after you're appointed. And then after that, you get a six year period of relief. So I know from talking to other judges, we all value that, that six year time, um, but it's, it's certainly great to, to get around the state and it, it's nicer to do it without that on your mind though. So, sure. Um, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a great court and um, we've got for the first time in a long time, a seat is actually coming up for an open seat. Um, Justice Hunstein is retiring and is letting her seat go to election. So we'll have, um, we'll have several incumbents on the ballot, but also an open seat. Um, and as you all know that our uh, judges, state court and um, appellate and Supreme Court justices, they are elected in nonpartisan races. Right. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes they're in those off years, not necessarily next year, but in those off years where um, turnout is low, but it's very important, especially in when we have um, races that, as lawyers, that we educate our neighbors and our friends and we, we turn out to vote because our vote really, are, they're important in those elections. And I'll, I'll add that I think it's really important that races in Georgia are nonpartisan for judicial seats. That's not the case in every state, but I'm really thankful it is in Georgia because mm -hmm. judging is not at all a political issue. Of course, everyone has political views, but they ideally have nothing to do with how you're judging. And so the fact that you, you don't even have to put that layer on things. I think it's really beneficial to the system and to helping judges and um, the, the bar and the other people in the state know that this is not a political position. This is a rule of law position. Absolutely. So um, how many cases do you have at the, uh, you know, we're, you're talking to a lot of bankruptcy judges mm -hmm. that have very high caseloads and manage, and I know that our state court judges um, are the same way. I mean. Our judicial system is a very busy place these days, and typically we're um, we're very judicial with our funds and our money and how we operate, and we're very efficient. And so, tell us a little bit about the Supreme Court. Sure. The um, I'll say this: the Court of Appeals has done a much better job than my court of getting the word out about how busy they are, and they they are very busy. Um, for instance, they've got 3,500 filings per year, which works out to about. 700 filings per judge because obviously the Court of Appeals has 15 judges and they're divided into five panels of three. 
Um, so basically, for, for the most part of the Court of Appeals, the total filings are divided by five. Um, at the Supreme Court, we've got about 2,000 filings per year, but that comes out to about 2,000 per judge. Um, I say that every decision that our court makes, except for if you want more pages for your brief or if you want more time to file your brief, literally every other decision gets made by all nine members of the court. Um, so we spend, we spend a great deal of time together talking about cases, reviewing cases, going back and forth on opinions, that sort of thing. Um, so we do about 360 published opinions per year, um, which is, I, I think, something like 40 per judge. Help me with my math. I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician. Um, interestingly, though, our page count for opinions is up about 47 percent since 2010. <laughs> so you're writing longer opinions. We, we are. So I guess part of our workload we're bringing on ourselves, although I, I think it's for the best. And the one, we've not done a real analysis of this part of it, but one thing I suspect has made a difference, and you all appreciate so many of you being involved in federal practice, four out of the last five of us who have been appointed to the court have significant federal litigation backgrounds. So we're a little bit more accustomed to that model of dramatically long opinions and that sort of thing. So we try to do, we try not to, to go too far in that direction, but I do think that our opinions are significantly longer than they've been in the past. And hopefully that helps provide additional clarity to those who need to figure out what we've said. So um, are all cases that are appealed to the Georgia Supreme Court, are they automatically accepted? Or is there um, a certification process similar to the United States Supreme Court? It depends on the category. Um, for all murder appeals come to the Supreme Court. Um, so uh, if anyone appeals a murder conviction, that comes straight to us. We also handle all habeas cases at the Supreme Court. Um, and then we have all constitutional cases come directly. So if an issue, if a case raises for the first time an issue of interpretation of the Georgia Constitution or the federal Constitution. That comes straight to us. If a, if a later case raises the same issue, then that will go to the Court of Appeals. But in the first instance, those cases go to us. And then, so we have all those three categories of automatic cases. And then we have certiorari, like the United States Supreme Court. Um, so cases that have come through the Court of Appeals that either have a great amount of gravity or perhaps there's some uncertainty things like that. Um, so we'll, we are more selective about, we have the ability to be selective about those cases, although I'll note that we've also gone up in the percentage of cert grants each year in the last, the last several years. And what about, um, I have my case, it's before the Georgia Supreme Court, and I would like oral arguments. Um, um, all you have to do is ask for it. So at a, at a bar meeting, someone was asking how much time they should, they should spend on explaining the reasons why they need oral argument. And I said, well, <laughs> you can decide on your own time management, but I'd keep in mind that your request will be granted no matter how much justification you put in it. So you can decide how much time you'd like to spend on that. So for right now, if you ask for oral argument, you, you will receive it. And um, how is that different than the Georgia Court of Appeals? The Georgia Court of Appeals actually is extremely, um, um, I'll try to use the right word, limited in the number of cases that they grant oral argument for. Um, and I think, you know, I think I appreciate that we have more, that we have more oral argument. I think to me it's always helpful. I, I usually have a, a sense of what I think the answer is in the case, but it's always helpful to get those questions answered and learn a little bit more. And I think all of us have changed our mind based on oral presentations. Really? And so um, how much time do, um, is a party granted for oral argument? The, the default is 20 minutes per side. Um, although we often encourage parties that just because you have 20 minutes doesn't mean you need to take it. If you have one key issue that takes 10 minutes, no one will complain if you go ahead and have a seat after your 10 minutes. Ordinarily, on many days, we'll have four cases in the morning and then four in the afternoon. So um, every, every minute that someone decides not to use is appreciated. But and, if you need it, you need it. And do you have oral arguments every week, or um, are you in a, um, a session? It varies from month to month. Um, we, have, we have terms, and Georgia is the only, the only state or the only entity that I know that has appellate court deadlines. So constitutionally, in state courts, for the courts of appeal, we have the, what's called the two-term rule. So every case needs to be decided within two terms of when it's docketed. Um, so that's one, that's one other reason that we keep pretty busy. Um, but 
ordinarily, I'd say during a, during a given month, my guess is that we hear oral argument between two and four days, most often morning and afternoon, but it, it can vary depending on the month. Um, in December, we've got just two mornings of oral argument. It's a, little, it's a little bit slower of a month. And then in January, we've got a very busy oral argument calendar. So it varies, it varies from time to time. And the justice that takes the lead on a particular case, um, is that a, just a random rotational um, basis or? Again, this is a funny rule that I'm not familiar with other courts using, but opinions are assigned to a justice as soon as the case is docketed. Um, so, you know, that's, that's unusual. You think of the U.S. Supreme Court kind of hashing it out in conference and determining, okay, the vote is 5-4, someone in the five will take it. Um, but on our court, the case is assigned when it's docketed. So of course, if there's a disagreement and that judge ends up in the minority, um, the, the majority opinion will be assigned to someone else. Although occasionally someone will say, well, I'll write uphill, which means maybe I've only got three people on my side right now, but I really think I'm right, and I think I can persuade at least a few more of you that I'm right. So um, a, a lot of times judges will try to write uphill and persuade their colleagues if they're in the minority on an opinion that they've been assigned. That's a great phrase. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're going to shift a little bit from, um, well, first, before we do that, what are some of the jurisdictions, you mentioned some of the jurisdictional um, issues that are mandatory to go to the Supreme Court. Um, what about the, what is the difference in from a jurisdictional perspective of the Georgia Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals? We recently actually, again, on January 1, we had a pretty important jurisdictional change. And this, to my understanding, there had been commissions from time to time over the last several decades because the jurisdictional arrangements really didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, if one of my colleagues um, has talked about this a lot and says that when the, when the Supreme Court was first developed, it was during an earlier time, it was during the 1800s, and obviously it was, it was developed by landed men for the, to handle the most important issues. And the most important issues at that time for landed men were what happens to my land when I die? Um, what happens to my land if I get divorced? What happens to my land if someone sues me? Um, so it was, all very, it was all very land related. So consequently, the Georgia Supreme Court had, among these other cases I talked about, we had direct appeal of divorce cases, direct appeals of wills, um, direct appeal of equity issues, and there's one more related to that. In any event, those, those types of cases at one time were extremely important to lots of people. Um, and now those types of cases are extremely important to the people that are involved in them, but they're less important to the, to the people who are not involved in them. So it really didn't make a whole lot of sense for nine people to be going back and forth on the minute <coughs> details of a will or a divorce agreement. And I can tell you, some of the strongest disagreements sometimes happen on those cases. Um, you all know in these minute details, there can be very, very tiny things that make a big difference. And so it's, it's a lot more efficient. Those cases now go for direct appeal to the Court of Appeals, where three judges can work on them. Um, it's much more efficient. But then, to the extent that there are issues that are important for the entire state, then we can certainly take a look at those issues on cert. So um, shift a little bit be before be um, about the operation of the court. Um, let's talk a little bit about the relationship between the State Bar of Georgia mm -hmm. and the Supreme Court, because I think a lot of times the lawyers really don't appreciate that nuance of the relationship between our State Bar and the way that our bar was formed and our relationship with the Supreme Court. The, the State Bar of Georgia is actually an administrative arm of the Supreme Court, and it's, it's not something that I think is really well known, but ultimately the Supreme Court has authority over the State Bar. Um, so we're really responsible for the practice of law in this state. Obviously every lawyer who practices in this state is required to be a member of the Bar. The Bar has a lot of important administrative responsibilities of its own. But ultimately, um, although the, we rely we rely very strongly on the leadership of the bar and the membership of the bar, but ultimately the court um, is responsible for approving bar rules and bar decisions and things like that. Yeah. So you may not appreciate, but we are really fortunate in the state of Georgia, the relationship that our state bar and our leadership in our state bar that we have with our Supreme Court justices, and it really does make um, the efficiency and practice, practice of law um, just a, um, a much more efficient, and it's also um, a much more 
um, collegiate way of doing business. So, for instance, if we have an issue that, that comes up and we need our bar rules amended, it takes place usually out of committee, up through the um, through committee, through the executive committee, eventually to our board of governors, but then it goes over to the Supreme Court. But during that time period, because we have this relationship, um, it's not like all of a sudden we're springing a rule, a new rule onto the Supreme Court. Um, they've usually been a part of, or at least have heard, some of the meetings, some of the background of it. And then the same is when the Supreme Court sees something that's very important, um, they have the relationship with our leadership to bring up issues that are of great concern to them in the practice of law. And it allows this um, just really, a, um, if you go to other states, a lot of other states, they do not have that relationship between the um, state bar and, the, and their Supreme Court. Um, one of the um, roles that you all may see in the daily report, um, if you get the daily report, you know, you see the lawyer disciplinary. Um, we, see, we see the Supreme Court decisions related to lawyer disciplinary. So can you talk a little bit about that relationship between the Supreme Court and, and the lawyer disciplinary process? Sure. We don't initiate the lawyer discipline process, but the, the state bar initiates that process, whether sometimes on its own initiative or oftentimes the... Um, the office will get reports from um, lawyers or citizens who are concerned about a, a particular lawyer. And there, there's often an internal process of the court with hearings and often a special master so that the, um, the state bar can make a recommendation to the court. And then we will review the case as a bank. We take that very seriously. That's one of the um, parts of our bank meetings. It's what we call our meetings with all nine of us where only the members of the court are present. We take the confidentiality of lawyer discipline very seriously, and we understand that um, these issues are important for, for these lawyers and also for their clients or would-be clients. So we take our responsibility in that area very seriously and are thankful for the great resources of the bar and helping work through those, those processes and for protection of, of the bar as a whole. And so um, there the were be a recommendation to the Supreme Court, either through a special master or at the discipl lawyer disciplinary committee or however it's worked its way up. And so, but the Supreme Court is the one that makes the final decision of whether a lawyer is um, suspended, whether they are disbarred. Um, but, and it's, and so it's, a lot of people think that the state bar um, is the re responsible entity for that, but really it's the, it's the Supreme Court. Um, so now shifting on to the, um, the Chief, the Chief Justice Commission on Professionalism. So that was created in March of 1989, and it was the brainchild of Justice Thomas Marshall and past president, uh, press, um, Emory University president, James Laney. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about why the commission was created? Sure, and this was the first there. It's now a very popular, um, a very popular kind of entity to have around the country, but Georgia was the first state that had an entity of this sort that was really dedicated to encouraging professionalism. And the genesis of it was that leaders, as you suggest, were concerned that lawyering was losing its sense of professionalism and its sense of a um, being a calling rather than a job. Um, and I think we, we still see those concerns a lot today, but this this entity was, was founded in order to encourage lawyers to maintain that feeling that the the um, profession of lawyering is, is a true calling and is a, an important um, foundational piece of our, of our society and our government, really. If you think about what separates us from, from anarchy is the law. And I think that it's easy to make a lot of, a lot of lawyer jokes, and we, I know we've all heard them. Um, but if you, if you think about professionalism and lawyering at its highest, that's really what it's all about, is preserving and maintaining the rule of law and being leaders in our community. And I think it's, it's easy to forget that. And this commission is tied to trying to encourage, encourage people to remember that. We talk about the four C's, which are competence, civility, character, and commitment to the rule of law. Um, and I know that one initiative we've been talking about more recently is care, which is caring for yourself as a, as a person in a wellness sense. I think We've all seen a lot of recent statistics about the um, higher rates of depression among lawyers, higher rates of alcoholism and things like that. And I think the, as a profession, I think we're starting to look at 
making sure that we're providing opportunities for the members of our profession to have wellness initiatives and have some thinking about how we, how we maintain that wellness. You can't be a good attorney if you are suffering those sorts of problems. So it's all interconnected. Yeah, and if, if you're not aware, the State Bar of Georgia um, has, a, has a wellness initiative. It's Lawyers Living Well. And if you go to Lawyers Living Well or the State Bar and click through, um, if you don't know, there are a ton of member benefits there, discounts from um, fitness centers, yoga, and it's throughout the whole state. Um, and so if you're looking for anything in the wellness area, you should visit that website because you may, be, you may qualify for a discount. And then also, um, we have a uh, lawyer suicide prevention um, program which actually the Board of Governors a couple years ago increased, I think it was three that you used to be offered, three free counseling sessions, and we increased it. It was either three and it went to five, or it was five and it went to seven. But that's also out there for anyone that's um, having a difficult time navigating and needs a little bit further assistance. So our state bar is out there, and, um, and a lot of this comes from the relationship between the commission, the Supreme Court, and the state bar again. Um, so what's kind of, who, who who is on the commission? How were you appointed? So this one I'm going to refer to my notes because there are 22 members. So I know you'll all forgive me. Don't worry, I won't name their names. You'll and they're in your for materials. Not, for not remembering um, chapter and verse each one. But the, um, the commission has these 22 members, which include the chief justice and or his or her designee, um, the chief judge of the court of appeals or their designee, one Superior Court judge who's designated by the Council of Superior Court Judges, one State Court judge um, designated by that council, five law school faculty members um, from the deans of the, who are appointed by the deans of the accredited law schools here in Georgia. And I'll give a side note that one of the most important things that the Professionalism Commission does is working with and through these faculty members to have professionalism initiatives for one else when they first start school. So the educational process is really a key part of it to let people know from the very outset that this is what professionalism is all about. Um, there are also two non-lawyer citizens from the public at large, the president of the state bar, the president of the young lawyers division of the state bar, a federal district judge, eight members of the state bar who are actively engaged in the practice of law, including one who's a government employee, one who's engaged in criminal defense, one who's a federal or state prosecutor, and one who's an in-house counsel. Um, and then, I think that may be, that may be the, end, the end of the line. Um, but you, what you can tell from that is that it's intended to be and is an extremely diverse group of lawyers with different areas of practice and different things to contribute. And so we, we often have very dynamic discussions. And you learn things that, um, that people are worried about in different areas of practice. And so what does the commission, what, what does it do? We, we work on educational programming, um, not limited to, but certainly including these initiatives at the beginning of law school. It, um, it provides periodic recommendations to the state bar and to other entities relating to professionalism, um, coordinate state bar activities, um, work on the, the CLEs related to professionalism. Obviously, each person is each lawyer is required to have one hour of professionalism, and the commission approves all of those hours and sometimes helps develop many of those hours also. And um, also manages and awards the Robert, the Justice Robert Benham Community Service Awards, which are a really, it's a really important award given each year to a lawyer who has done excellent service in their community above and beyond being a lawyer. Um, we know that, again, Lawyering as a profession involves being a leader in your community and being um, being actively engaged, and so the commission is really dedicated to honoring people who have gone above and beyond in that direction. Um, and I um, was fortunate because someone else um, was kind enough to nominate me and uh, received that award many years ago. And I will encourage you if you have someone in your community um, that is involved in the community Absolutely. and, um, please, the, the commission is always seeking nominations when the time, I think it just closed. It just closed. Um, so mark your calendars for, for next, year. next year. Um, but they really do seek a wide variety of individuals for that award. And it's a great way for you to acknowledge someone that's serving in your community. And it's, it's a wonderful evening and it's, a, it's just a lot of fun. That's a, um, a really 
nice thing that, that the commission um, does for lawyers and people in the community to and be it's, recognized. It's throughout the state, and I know we've got a wide range of um, a wide range of representation from Georgia here. And I think especially it's great to hear about um, people doing exciting things not in Atlanta. I think. Because we have meetings in Atlanta, many of the members tend to be from Atlanta. Um, we try to have it be as geographically diverse as possible, but as you know, lawyers have a lot of demands on their time, so there's only so many people who can drive from Thomasville to Atlanta you know, six times a year for a meeting. So please do make sure that you're thinking of people in your community, because if, if there's not a member of our commission in your community, we may not be aware of the great service that's going on, but we'd love to recognize it. So please do keep that top of mind. Yeah, and um, I know that some people in this room have taken advantage of the law practice management program at the State Bar. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know that that was actually um, came out of the commission with the, addressing the concern of lack of civility and economic pressures of practicing law, and that that was a program that, that came out of the commission. So there are a lot of um, uh, awards, other programs that have um, come out of the commission which benefit all of us practicing lawyers. The, um, um, so in, the, um, in our materials that the, the commission provided, um, there's a quote from Chief Justice Harold Clark on, from the Georgia Supreme Court. and said, the idea, the idea is that ethics is a minimum standard which is required of all lawyers, while professionalism is the higher standard expected of all lawyers. And there's another great quote from Just, uh, Chief Justice Benham who said, we should expect more of lawyers than compliance with legal and ethical requirements. And um, I thought it was interesting that it says, ethic, decision, ethic discussions tend to focus on misconduct and negative dimensions of lawyering, while professionalism discussions have an affirmative di dimension, a focus on conduct that preserves and strengthens the dignity, honor, and integrity of the legal system. And I thought that was a great way to think about the difference between ethics and professionalism, but Justice, what do you, how do you see the difference of, of ethics and professionalism and from, from your viewpoint now being on the, on the bench? Well, I think, first of all, those quotes are a great, a great reminder of the difference. It's very easy to, to overlap the two and think, well, why, don't, why do we need an ethics, an ethics credit and a professionalism credit? Aren't those the same? But they're really not. I'm sure you can all silently to yourself think of a lawyer that maybe has been an opponent of yours or something like that where they've never done anything illegal or against the rules, but you've not thought that they handled themselves as well as they could have. And I think that's really the difference between ethics and professionalism. I think professionalism to me is you say, you know, I like being an opponent of that person um, in a case because I know that even even if their client is completely opposed to my client they're going to be fair to me and it's not going to be um, a bad experience whenever I see them or whenever I talk to them and I think you can have those relationships you know with lawyers who are side by side with you as well and so I think it's important it really professionalism really is about having the the highest and best example of the calling of being a lawyer and that commitment to um, to not just doing the minimum, mm -hmm. to really making sure you do what you can. And I think this is a little bit longer of a quote than I would ordinarily read, but it, it really speaks a lot to this to me too, and so I thought I would, at the risk of having all of us fall asleep. <laughs> um, Carl Llewellyn, who is a, a top legal scholar who taught at Yale, Columbia, and the University of Chicago, said this, which is, the lawyer is a man of many conflicts, or woman. More than anyone else in our society, he must contend with competing claims on his time and loyalty. You must represent your client to the best of your ability and yet never lose sight of the fact that you're an officer of the court with a special responsibility for the integrity of the legal system. You will often find, brethren and cistern, that those professional duties do not sit easily with one another. You will discover, too, that they get in the way of your other obligations, to your conscience, your God, your family, your partners, your country, and all the other perfectly good claims on your energies and hearts. You'll be pulled and tugged in a dozen directions at once. You must learn to handle those conflicts. I think that really speaks to what all lawyers face in terms of competing obligations. Um, and I think it, it's something that really made me think about the, the struggles that we all have, but also the opportunity that we have and the important role. I think I've, in Georgia we give, when we swear in, um, bar members to the Georgia Supreme Court bar, one justice always gives 
words of advice. And it really makes you think, um, it makes me think when I'm hearing that being a lawyer is not just a job. And as I said at the beginning, the rule of law is the really foundation of what makes us a civilized society. And I think it's easy when you're a lawyer reviewing documents or trying to get that brief in or trying to you know, just do whatever the task is to think of it as just a, a rote job that you're doing. But I think it's important for all of us to remember that what we're doing very explicitly is contributing to the rule of law in this country. It makes a real difference. So it's important to keep that in mind, um, even during some of the boring tasks. You, know, you might not think, you might not think that it's that's so meaningful, but really it is because all of those things are what it takes to make the system work. Yeah, and you know, in professionalism, it's to our client, it's to the court, it's to our fellow um, lawyers, and um, so I always think of it. You know, it goes down, it goes sideways, it goes up. It's just. Um, you know, and I think in the bankruptcy community, we're really fortunate because, I, you know, being in a specialty bar and being with a specialty court, we're very unique because we're a large bar, unlike people that maybe practice before the tax court, which practices before a specialty court. But, you know, the bankruptcy community, as is, is we all know, especially those of us that do consumer work, that if an individual is going to have contact with the federal court system, most likely it's going to be the bankruptcy court. Um, and it's either going to be as a debtor or a creditor in that court system. And um, we see each other um, being, because we go to the same courtrooms for the most part, you know, week after week, maybe day after day even, um, you know, we see each other. And so I think the bankruptcy community, um, we have a very collegiate um, attitude towards one another, unlike some people that I know that practice in the state court, because maybe that's a lawyer that they will see, but they may only see them, their opponent once, um, where we see each other. And so you know if, um, if someone's asking something of you, um, it could come back <laughs> if you, you know, don't handle it in a professional manner, because in a week or two, you may need something from that other, um, that other that same person in another context. And so I think over the years, we have grown to understand that we have to work together. And you know whether it's uh, the debtor bar, the creditor bar, the trustees, the court, um, we understand that it takes us all pulling together sometimes, especially in the consumer world, to get, um, to get that case through the system, to get the debtor the, the relief that they need, or the creditor the relief that they need. Um, so I think that we're really fortunate when we talk about professionalism and ethics that while we're not perfect, and while we all could always take a moment and pause and remember that what we're doing is not just a business, um, I think that, is, that we, um, the nature of our work, because we're always helping those in, in trouble, mm -hmm. that we're constantly reminded of that call to public service and um, the need for professionalism. Um, so kind of shifting gears, Again, and we're getting ready to get into the question time period, but um, I'll start off with asking you a few questions. So what do you enjoy most about being on the court? I think um, I'll confess that I'm a pretty big nerd. And so <laughs> having, having the opportunity to really sit down and work through a legal issue and figure out the answer. Um, that sounds kind of preposterous that that would be my favorite thing, although I guess it's good since that's the core of the job. Um, it's a really, it's, that really is the, my favorite thing, is, is working hard to figure out what the right answer is. And you know, sometimes the bank meetings, I'll be going back and forth with something about another judge, and I think to myself, wow, I get paid to do this. This is really, <laughs> this is really fantastic. So. Yeah, I know Sarah Doyle, who's on the Court of Appeals, I know I heard her speak recently, and she was talking about, you know, especially if you're um, seeking for a judgeship, that um, you know, deciding whether you want to be on an appellate court or on superior court, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like the district court or our appellate courts. So, you know, is your passion more in, in writing and discerning that law, um, or is it more of you know trying that case? And, right. You know, and Judge Doyle was saying that you know she really enjoys the same type of thing. You know, getting into the to the nitty gritty of the law or doing the research and writing the opinions. Mm -hmm. And um, so yes, we're glad that we have folks like you that have chosen that. Those, those places. What do you think about cameras in the courtroom? So I think, I think particularly... You um, have them in the... In we, the. we do, and I, I think it's fantastic. Um, I'll set, I think the United States Supreme Court is frankly a, a different question, um, which we can talk about, but I think 
for our court, I think it's really wonderful that the arguments are live streamed online. Um, particularly for a, a state court, I think it's really meaningful that everyone in the state, if they have an interest in a particular case, can see how that case plays out without getting in the car and driving or without making a hotel reservation, without putting aside their practice for two days. Um, so I think it's really important from a transparency perspective and from a um, from an opportunity for folks to follow along cases that maybe they find interesting or maybe that they think are really meaningful. So I think it's, I think it's really wonderful. And this is probably hard for you to answer because you've only been on the court since they have cameras in the courtroom, but do you think it changes the, um, the way the judges act or the way the litigants act in the courtroom? So I, d I don't think so personally. I'm sure you could find, in any situation, you could find someone who would say that it was different, but the cameras are really subtle and there's no, they're all um, manned from a person who's kind of back several rooms away. So you really don't notice it. The Oz behind the curtain. Exactly, exactly. You really don't notice it. And I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not conscious of it. And I think even when I was arguing before the court, it wasn't something I thought about. And I made a practice of not watching my arguments afterwards because I knew that I would have all sorts of thoughts about what I could have or should have said. So I'd, as an advocate, I tried to put it out of my mind. And as a judge, I don't think about it now. Um, so it's more, I think, for the benefit of those who are interested in the case. And for, frankly, for people who, um, I know most of you are involved primarily in federal practice, but if you've got, if for some reason you ever have a case coming up before our court, I think it's a great opportunity to just go back to the archives and watch a couple oral arguments, see how things go, get familiar with it, see what kinds of questions the judges ask, what kind of interactions there are, um, just kind of the, the, general, the general way that things go. I think it's a pretty useful learning tool also. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you were speaking to a group of fifth graders, um, what would you want them to know or understand about our justice system? I think the, the two, two most important things are the two most basic things, which are one, the rules apply to everybody. Um, I think that no matter, how, no matter how powerful you are or how weak you are, the law applies to you um, both, both as a protective matter and as a penalty if, if you do something wrong. And I think as a, as a follow-on to that, I think everyone who walks into the court is equal and can expect and demand equal justice. I think that's important for, for kids to know. Yeah. And we're so fortunate that that's the judicial system that we operate under in our country. Um, so as lawyers, what can we do to fulfill that, um, that thought? Again, I would focus on making sure that you, that you remember that your profession is not only to serve your particular clients, but that you're serving the entire bulwark of the rule of law. And again, I think it's, it's hard for all of us to remember no matter what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but I think it's important, um, important to remember that you've got a higher calling than just the particular task you're working on in that moment. I think that helps all of us do a better job to think of it in the bigger picture. And so um, kind of your parting words before we go into Q&A um, for a group of bankruptcy um, practitioners and judges, do you? First, no questions about bankruptcy law, please. Um, <laughs> but second, thank you for the work you do. As Nancy, as you said, you're all dealing with clients who are in incredibly stressful, tough situations, whether it's a corporation or a person or anything in between. I think bankruptcy is not the most um, not the most easy situation. And so I know you all have callings as counselors on top of everything else, I'm sure. So thank you for all that you do. I, I think it makes a real difference in a lot of people's lives and it's appreciated by those of us who are at the bar. Thanks. All right, so we're gonna turn it over to the audience for some questions. So I know there are some good questions out there pondering. Walter? Have you been surprised at some of the bankruptcy cases that have been referred to the Supreme Court from the 11th Circuit? We've had several of them recently, and some of the lawyers, the new lawyers in the room, were litigants in those cases. Recently, uh, um, one of our trustees, Ms. Webster, had a health mm -hmm. savings account case. We also had some other cases that you know, we have to just send it to y'all to figure out what did, what did the legislature mean by it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I wouldn't say surprise, and obviously, it's since this has been my my one year on the bench, I haven't, I have no perspective on an on an uptick. But I do think that's one reason it's important that we we all in the court pride ourselves on being generalists because 
even if it's not an area of law that we are looking at every day, I think it's, it's important to use those same tools of statutory interpretation to try to interpret what those words mean and what the, what the law of Georgia is. So I think, um, in a way, it's useful. I think I've been, I'm heartened when we get questions like that because I think it's an opportunity for us as a state entity to ensure that we're letting federal courts know what our state law is rather than, rather than having that other, um, that other system of government letting us know what they think. Good question. So my question is a follow-up to that. Is there a different procedure that the court uses for certified questions from the circuit, or is it the same procedure that you would have in a, uh, a normal review? Same procedure. Um, same procedure. As far as internally, it's, it's really like any other case um, with argument and discussion and the process and all of that. So those cases, like any other, for instance, are assigned to a judge as soon as they get docketed things like that. And is the, is the assignment to the judge, is it a random? Mm -hmm. We call it the wheel. Okay. Same as in the bankruptcy right. court. Um, other questions? It's my job to ask questions sometimes. I can just call them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we really thank you so much for making the trek out here to Lake Oconee and, um, and sharing your time with us. And um, if anybody has any questions about um, the commission or what it's doing or ways to get involved, um, you know, just speak up. They have a great website. And Carly Greer is the current um, executive director, is that her title? Yes, and she's fantastic. She just started, and I think you'll see a lot more. Um, she's very energetic, and so we're looking forward to, to following up on some of her great ideas. Yeah, and just as, as you may know, um, for CLE, we pay a premium for professionalism hours, and I believe it's now it's $9 uh, that we pay when you to get your professionalism credit. I think it's $3, don't quote me on this, but I think it's $3 for regular credit hours for, is anybody here from ICLE in the it's room? It's actually, it's five for regular credit, and then you add 15 for professionalism. Oh, so it's 15. Which I suspect is one reason that people take less professionalism, so that's something we're looking at. We shouldn't actually disincentivize professionalism <laughs> credits. So, um, but about those fees go to fund a yes. lot of the activities for the commission, and that's why you pay a supplement for your hour of professionalism, is so that um, it's the way that the revenue is generated for the commission to operate and to be able to do all of the, the great programming that they do throughout the state. So please know that your money, while it, um, it's a little bit more, it is going to great work and um, benefiting our profession throughout the, throughout the state. So. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Thank you.